Pilani. In 1981, he was selected for the PhD program at Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, but left for the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai in 1982 as a research scholar in the theoretical astrophysics group. There he did his PhD with Professor Jayan Narikar on cosmological distribution of radio galaxies while collaborating with late Professor uh, Geoffrey Babbage. Soon after submitting his PhD thesis in 1988, he joined Ayuka Pune as a postdoctoral fellow. During 1989-90, he had short stints at the University of Wales, UK, as a senior research follow, uh, fellow to study gravitational wave data analysis techniques, as well as at the observa observatory in uh, Paris, to have an exposure to the, to the topic of gravitational radiation uh, from uh, Hulse Taylor binary pulsar. During these visits, he worked with Professor Schulz and Professor De Moon, uh, respectively. After his return for, to Ayuka, he worked with Professor Nalikar on radiation waves generated from mini creation events in the cosmos. <coughs> he joined the Department of Physics and Astrophysics, University of Delhi in 1993, and has been a full professor there since 2004. His research activities include studies related to uh, baryogenesis from uh, primordial black holes, confirmation of Hawking area theorem from the observed gravitational waves from binary black holes proposing a unified model for gamma ray bursts and fast radio bursts, modeling dark energy, torsion, and churn simone gravity using a dynamical core form, mechanisms to generate supermassive black holes from those Einstein condensation of bosonic dark matter, as well as emission of EM waves and gravitational waves from a pair of interacting diamonds. He was elected as the president of Indian Association of General Relativity and Gravitation uh, for the term March 14, 2020 to March 13, 2022. He was invited to deliver the Ved Ratna Memorial Lecture in 2021. The team associated with the educational journal, Resonance, invited him to join its editorial board in 2020 and is currently an associate edit editor there. He had also been active in training and leading students to the International Physics Olympiad under the aegis of Kumi Bhava Center for Science Education, TIFR, Mumbai. So, welcome you, sir, and we are looking forward to your talk. So am I on? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, as I was saying, that uh, it's a privilege for me, thanks to the organizers, that I'm going to talk to you and interact with you. Uh, so remember that science is all about doubting and showing your skepticism, not believing what previous people have said, and that's how science progresses. And you will be surprised to know that the way ancient philosophers or scientists, because science definition came only very late, only after Galileo came into the scene, but great thinkers of ancient India had started this whole idea of challenging the existing views. So can I have the next slide please? And obviously, the first person who actually started doing scientific work was the great genius Aryabhatta, who historians believe was born in the year 476 Christian era. Uh, and he, it is believed, was one of the Navaratnas of the Vikramaditya school. Vikramaditya, either you can say it was the Chandragupta Gupta or Skandagupta Gupta figure. It is a Gupta dynasty. <coughs> and according to legend, of course, there is not much of historical evidence that Aryabhatta was in the same court as was Kalidas, the other great genius with whom we, as we associate great Sanskrit poets, poetry, and plays like Meghaduttam. Avidyanam, Shakuntalam, and etc. So that was really 
as far as scholarly contributions from India is concerned, that was the golden age. That's why several people call the Gupta period as the golden age, and it lasted for from about 400 AD to around 600 AD. And it's unfortunate that we lost out on Renaissance had thinkers accepted this great genius Aryabhatta's thesis. In fact, some of the very good mathematicians, I will not name them, they actually rejected many of the things which was pioneering, which came from the genius Aryabhatta. First of all, he was the first Indian and one of the few thinkers who argued that the reason sun's motion is going around earth, that is sun rises in the morning, sets in the evening, is not because sun is moving around earth, but it's earth which is spinning. All right. No, no. Uh, let's go back to the previous slide. Uh, so, he was one of the few people. There were few others like Greek scholar, Hipparchus, etc. But he was one of the few people who sort of argued that earth spins around its axis. So, scholars asked him if earth spins around its own axis, why are it thrown out of the earth? After all, people, pottery was very common in India. So, potters, when they make clay pots and turn it around the wheel, they must have seen that when you have a loose mud, it just flies tangentially, which you know is because of centrifugal force. So people asked him, if indeed earth spins around its own axis, why aren't we thrown off? Then Aryabhatta said, there must be some attractive force from the earth's central region which keeps us holding. So he was in a way already spe speculating about an attractive gravitational force due to Earth, which keeps us from flying off tangentially due to the centrifugal force. Furthermore, if you leave aside Hipparchus, who lived around 100 BC in Greece, Aryabhatta was one of the few people who gave the, he understood the real cause of solar and lunar eclipses and he gave act, actual thing, we will talk about it soon. And you might be astounded that he developed the mathematical science Great. Next slide, please. So, his work, by the way, I must mention that when I'm talking about Aryabhatta, I'm talking about Aryabhatta 1, because there was a second Aryabhatta who came much later, many hundred years later. He is referred to as Aryabhatta 2. But this is Aryabhatta 1, who lived in the 5th century AD. So, he composed two works, Aryabhatta. Aryabhatta Siddhan. The Aryabhatta Siddhan doesn't exist with us anymore. But it went from India to the northwest part, and then scholars, the Iranian and Arab scholars, they studied Aryabhatta Siddhan. This we know from another great genius, Al Barun, who came to India around 10th century AD. He was a polymath, he knew many things. He had studied Aryabhatta's work and he, he was one of the first guy to have praised Aryabhatta's great uh, genius, although he was coming after 600 years of Aryabhatta's uh, having graced India. So, in Aryabhatta and Aryabhatta Siddhan, he talks about how to find out the square roots of numbers, few groups of numbers, solving quadratic equation, similarly the estimated value of pi, and during that time it was one of the most accurate 
approximation of the value of y. So I think he got it to 3.142. Now we know it's 3.1416, etc. It's, it's, it's an irrational number. So you can't terminate that again. Similarly, we established a table of sine function and did a great deal of work on spherical trigonometry as well as trigonometry. Spherical trigonometry normally is not taught to school students and college students. Uh, while if you do astrometry, do positional astrometry, then spherical trigonometry is very essential. Similarly, he uh, established proper time measurement, water clocks, etc. And he showed that the best way to start the zero of the time is the midnight. And he therefore used, because time measurement, if you don't do proper time measurement, you cannot do physical science. Galileo is genius, and the reason we say Galileo is the father of physics was that he could get very accurate time measurement devices, the pendulum, for example, A. And as a reason, he could give simple laws of motion. Without time measurement, most of the physical science cannot be done. And Aryabhatta was the first Indian to have already started the proper, may not be as accurate as Galileo, proper time measurement. And then he studied the planetary motions. Those planets which were known at that time, of course, the planets like Neptune, Uranus, Pluto, they were discovered much, much later. But Jupiter, Saturn, they were all known and they already had entered the mythology like Shani Graha or Vyaspati Graha or Shukra Graha, they had entered the mythology. But Aryabhatta being a thinker and pioneer of science, he was actually talking in terms of objects that were going around the... He didn't quite establish that they were going around the sun, but he knew that they were not going around Earth. So geocentric viewpoint was already being challenged by Aryabhatta. And as I said, the rising and setting of sun or any star, he argued that it's not due to get they are moving around Earth, but because Earth is moving. And he also gave the correct explanation for why moon and other planets look bright during the night. It is because they reflect the light of the sun. So he was already saying that these objects, they don't produce their own light. They only reflect the light. And a very proper understanding of lunar and solar eclipses were established by Aryabhatta, which of course were more uh, fine-tuned by Brahamira and later by the mathematician Brahmagupta. And he could predict when would lunar eclipse occur, when would uh, solar eclipse occur. Next slide, please. Yeah. So, although this is modern understanding of lunar and solar eclipses, but this was already known to uh, Aryabhatta and he showed by drawing diagrams as to what happens. But before I go into this, I must ask you that recently, just one or two days after Deepavali, there was a partial solar eclipse. Now, would you be surprised? In fact, the probability that you will have either total or partial <coughs> solar eclipse, just close to Deepavali is actually quite natural. So later on, you tell me why it is natural. If you can't answer, then I will give the explanation. Right. Is there some pointer or something? Doesn't, doesn't, doesn't. So I can. Yeah, so we know that the reason why there is a lunar eclipse is not all full moon nights you see lunar eclipse. The reason is, is this was all 
explain very well by Aryabhatta is because the orbital plane of moon around earth, that plane is inclined by about 5 degrees with respect to the orbital plane of sun going around, uh, earth going around the sun. Okay? So these two planes are inclined. And any two planes, you know, any two planes which are not coplanar, they have to intersect along a line. And the intersection point of these two almost circles, the ellipses but close to circles, is the so-called nodes. Only when the moon is in one of the nodes, will either have lunar eclipse or solar eclipse. So this is the time when there is a node and earth exactly comes between moon and sun and therefore there is a shadow both there is a total eclipse and there is an umbra, umbra shadow and there is also a penumbra shadow you all know from school days when you have extended light source there will be both umbra and penumbra that is the reason why under a tube light, the big light light you see sometimes double shadows or umbra and penumbra similarly during the solar eclipse time it is a moon which comes between sun and earth and obviously you can't see the moon and if the not seeing the moon that dark disk it keeps on you know coming in front of the sun and starts doing the eclipses so this way very nicely explained by Aryabhata and because he knew that the plane is 5 degrees to the ecliptic plane the plane means the plane in which earth goes around the sun. So the two planes they make an angle 5 degrees and that's the reason why not all full moon nights you will see lunar eclipse and not all Amavasya or new moon night you will have new moon days you will have solar eclipse. Next slide please. So now I will come to another great astronomer. He lived only in the 19th century, but he did astounding works by himself. He had no modern education. His name is Pathani Saman Chandrasekhar. Chandrasekhar. Pathani Saman Chandrasekhar. Uh, I must tell you that I am indebted to my name why Dr. Ratnashri, who actually did a lot of uh, studies on Pathani Saman Chandrasekhar when she was the director of Nehru Planetarium, she also organized a program in which people would invent their rather uh, make their own instruments just like Pathani Chandrasekhar had uh, done to find out the angular separation measurement. So Pathani Chandrasekhar, he lived in the 19th century and was totally trained with traditional knowledge that means the Siddhantas, Aryabhata Siddhant, Varavira Siddhant, Brahmagupta Siddhant, he had no modern education and then this Indian government launched a stamp on a big uh, Pathani Saman Chandrasekhar and here in this uh, painting much uh, done much later, he is shown holding his own composition in Sanskrit for Siddhanta Dharma. As you know, the traditional astronomy texts which are written in Sanskrit, they are called Siddhantas, just like Aryabhita Siddhant, Brahmiras, Priyat Siddhant, something like that. Yeah, next slide please. So, Pakhani Saman Chandrasekhar. Uh, belong to a princely family of Khandapada uh, which is in Odisha and he was born in 1835. Uh, today in Odisha if you go, Odisha people of course know his name. Uh, he is called Pathani Saman. He was referred to Pathani because when he was a little kid he had a deadly disease. People thought that he will not survive but then his parents took him to a Pathan Sufi saint. And the Pathan Sufi said apparently blessed him, gave him some medicine, and that's how he survived, and that's why he is called Pathani Samantha. So, as you can see, that he studied only the Sanskrit text, no modern education, although he was 
born in the 19th century. Then it was extremely bright and serious. He found that the Siddhantas, they give some time as to when the stars will appear, uh, the so-called sidereal time when the stars will appear as Earth spins. But he found, look, he was actually doing measurement. That's what science is all about. Remember, science cannot be there if you don't do measurement. Of course, you do theoretical analysis based on measured data. And yes, that's the reason why you have to do a lot of mathematics because any measurement will give you numbers. So sometimes people ask me, why is mathematics so essential to physics? The real reason is that physics is based on measurement and any measurement, whether you are measuring length, time, mass, they are all in terms of numbers. And any logical doctrine that uses numbers have to be based on mathematics. So, he, because he was measuring, he was extremely, you know, perplexed as to why is it that Siddhanta scale tell us that stars must rise at this time, but you know. So, he developed new instruments. I'll show some of the instruments that he invented. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So, in his Siddhant Dharmada, which was, by the way, I'll tell you something about Yogesh Chandra Raya. So, he, that was Siddhant Dharmada in the Sanskrit, he starts that Pratakshanu Bhavad Na Lumpati Vacho Yipti Riyataha which means that no amount of arguments can defeat the results of direct observation. Now that, coming from a person who has been schooled completely traditional, no modern education, saying such a thing shows a genius. Because the traditional knowledge always emphasizes that you have to memorize what our past people have said. Don't question. But he, completely educated on traditional Sanskrit texts, he was actually questioning, he was saying that all these arguments stand nowhere in front of what you can directly observe and directly measure. By the way, I think previously, I yeah, must tell something about Yogesh Chandra Raya. Yogesh Chandra Raya, see, Pathani Saman Chandra would have gone completely unnoticed till from Kolkata to Chandra Rai he saw his Siddhanta Dharmana. Chandra Rai, of course he was Sanskrit, he read and oh my god, this is a work of a great scholar and a genius. He immediately translated some parts and sent it to nature here. And nature looked at the thing and realized that this person, Saman Chandrasekhar, he completely homeschooled, no knowledge of modern development, has given his own theory of planetary motion. I will show the picture, but so it is thanks to Yogesh Chandra Rai, who in 1898 translated Siddhan Dharmana, large part of Siddhan Dharmana in English, and sent it to nature journal, and nature read it. And Yogesh Chandra Rai said that this model which Chandrasekhar has developed is similar to Tycho Brahe. He is the Tycho Brahe of India. But nature said, no, he is much more than Tycho Brahe because Tycho Brahe had only established another rich aristocrat, Danish aristocrat Tycho Brahe, who his role is very important because he brought in Kepler and rest is history. Kepler uh, gave his three laws of motion based on the data that was collected by Dr. Tycho Brahe. So when Yogesh Chandra said that he is the Indian Tycho Brahe, the nature review, nature reviewed the work and said, no, Pathani Saman Chandra Shekhar is more than Tycho Brahe because he also developed a lot of indigenous instruments to measure many things. Next slide, please. Definitely yeah, next slide. Yeah, so Pathani Chandra Samantha gave his own model of 
planets and solar uh, sun movement. You can see what is the model he is talking about. He says that all planets except Earth and Moon go around the sun. So this is the sun. Every other planet that I know, Saturn, Jupiter, Mercury, <coughs> Venus, Mars, they all go around the sun. But this system as such is going around the Earth. Moon is going around the Earth and entire system carried by the sun is going around the Earth. It's similar to what Tycho Brahe had said. So it's still quasi-geocentric. Quasi-geocentric means that except for moon, all other plants are going around the sun. But this system is going around the so it's still geocentric, but the other planets are going around the sun, not at all. Let's read this. <coughs> yeah, so these are some of the instruments he built. Okay. Chakra Yantra for measuring time, Chakra Yantra for measuring the angular uh, shadow, like a sun dial. And <coughs> so this wire, instead of a flat plane as Roman for the sundial, he had a wire so that it cast very sharp plane. <coughs> then similarly, you have several measurements of time and that's the reason why nature said that he is much more than a typograph. Similarly, here some of the honours, as you know, the, by the way, I know this because I belong to Puri, uh, where you have this Lord Jagannath temple and Gajapati king. Even today, things have powerful role during the Rathayatra or the Trans festival. And as you know, that the English word Jagannath has come from Jagannath. Figure out why it was. Uh, so, uh, Gajapati king of Puri gave him the appellation of Harichandan Mahapatra, British government awarded him the title Mahamu Padhyaya and also a pension. So based on his calendar that Pathani Samantham Shikhar developed, the Jagannath Temple of uh, Puri adopted this calendar system. Next slide please. Now we come to 20th century. So this is about 19th century. And here, some of you can recognize this is a picture of illustrious scientists that time were in Kolkata. You can see this is Jagdish Chandra Bose. As you know, Jagdish Chandra Bose had invented a component that Markani used to study radio waves. Markani got the Nobel Prize, but Jagdish Chandra Bose did not. Some people say perhaps it's because the Dish Chandrabhut that time was claiming that the plants had developed an instrument called scrustograph which would measure the tiny movement of plants. He tried to claim that plants, if you there are plants have emotions. So although the strong argument that plants have emotions have not yet been verified, but recent research shows that yes, plants do react to certain shocking environmental changes. There is a recent research. But during that time he was, since his claim was very strong, he had become somewhat unpopular in Britain and that's maybe one of the reasons why his invention that was central to the measurement of radio wave propagation etc. for which uh, the radio communication for which Markini got the Nobel Prize, Jagdish Chandra Bose was overlooked. Here you can see Satyan Basu or Satyan Bose because of whose contribution uh, the integral spin particles are called bosons. So here it is Satyan Basu or in English way it would be Satyan Chandra Bose. Here is Meghnath Saha. And the rest of the people are who's who of that time Kolkata science group. Next slide, please. Now, many people don't know 
first ever translation in the world, first ever English translation of Einstein's and Minkowski's original papers, which were in German language. They were translated into English, English by Vigna Saha and SM Books. Okay. And the book appeared in 1920, but uh, uh, those who are interested in the history and the scientific sociology during that time, you can go. I have given a full fledged talk in Mad Science Chennai on Saha's work. It's in the YouTube. So those who are interested in the full thing, you can go to that YouTube thing on Saha and quantum theory. So, obviously, you know, as you know, Bose used to come first and Saha used to come second in their exam. In the final MSc, again, Bose came first, Saha came second, but there was no rivalry between them. They were extremely good friends. In fact, it was Saha who went to Dhaka where Bose was teaching and said about <coughs> the black body radiation formula. <coughs> which Planck had developed and when Bose looked at it more carefully, he gave an alternate proof and said twice and that's the rest of history. So you can see that uh, I will not talk much about Bose because he didn't do any work in astrophysics. Title is mostly about astrophysicists and cosmologists, but that's a separate, Bose's story is separate. But particularly Saha, although he did not do any work either on special relativity or general relativity, unlike Bose, but he was very inspired by special relativity throughout and he kept on coming back to this theme of the fact that energy mass equivalent, that anything that has mass m has energy mc squared and anything that has energy e has mass e by c squared. He comes, he came back to that in many papers later on. Next slide, please. So, as far as I could uh, do my research on Saha's contribution, he was the first Indian, and maybe one of the very few international astrophysicists who used quantum theory to study astronomical objects. His first paper on this subject is in 1919. Remember the time, 1919, you still don't have full fledged quantum mechanics. You only have old quantum theory. Okay. Old quantum theory based on Bohr's quantization, based on uh, Bohr's uh, Bohr Soma field quantization. No wave function, no Schrodinger equation. It's 1919. He Argued that the radiation pressure, those who have studied electrodynamics, you know that Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism is a classical theory of electric field and magnetic field. But even in the classical theory, Maxwell had already shown that a classical electromagnetic wave, as it moves, it carries with it energy and momentum. The momentum is what pointing flux, E cross B divided by 4 pi C, is the pointing flux. It carries the momentum. What Saha, looking at the stellar uh, atmosphere and all that, he realized that classical radiation pressure due to radiation coming from sun's photosphere on the atoms and molecules, the pointing pressure cannot explain this outflow. He realized that it is the photons and the energy levels of the atoms and molecules so there's a selective radiation pressure. Those photons will get absorbed by the atoms. Obviously, they will push back. Those who do not, they will not do anything to the atoms and molecules. So he developed a selective absorption, selective momentum transfer. And this paper created a stir in the international astrophysical community. Remember, it's 1990. Full fledged quantum mechanics is still not there. Next slide, please. So, he knew that photons, when atoms transit from higher energy level to uh, lower energy level, they emit photons. Already, photoelectric effect part has been explained by Einstein 
using the quantum of light in the photons. And immediately somehow use that to give rise to, uh, give the model about selective radiation pressure. Next slide, please. And of course, all this is because of the hard measurement of the discrete spectral light. Entire quantum revolution would have come without the direct measurement of discrete spectral light in contrast with continuous. Uh, spectrum of a light source like sun. So when gaseous elements were heated up, the radiation they emitted, they were not like this. Rather, they resulted in discrete lines. Only to understand this, let people realize that energy levels must be quantized. Next slide, please. So, this, this is basically whatever I have said. The this is the summary of that, that the classical momentum causing the radiation pressure in the pointing flux is inadequate. Rather, it is a selective radiation pressure on molecules and atoms. Because only those photons that get absorbed by the absorption molecule will push the absorption molecules away. Next slide, please. Yeah, so immediate application of selective radiation pressure were made to tails of comets, why comets develop tail when they come near the sun. As you know, when comets are very far from the solar system, they are like a spherical icy ball, dirty ice ball. But when they come towards the sun, they develop a tail which is pointing away. It's because of this radiation from the sun and you have to use selective radiation pressure. That is those molecules which whose energy levels can be absorbed or excited by such radiation, they are thrown outwards. Similarly, they are applied, uh, the solar prominences, when you have a solar flare, sometimes radiation forms an arch along the magnetic field of the sun, those could be explained by the selective radiation pressure. And similarly, the corona, there is a very high temperature, extended gaseous or rather plasma emission much beyond the photosphere which you see during the total solar eclipse. It could be uh, more systematically studied after using selective radiation. Next slide. I uh, will skip this because this is not really... Uh, see, Vignan Sao is incredible. He could do a lot of fundamental physics also. So as soon as magnetic monopole was talked about, Virat gave a magnetic monopole model of protons and neutrons and soon later the great mathematical physicist Schwinger, he also talked about magnetic monopole model of uh, protons and neutrons because quarks had not yet come to the scene. Anyway, let me skip this. So, Sahas, although Saha did a lot of work in fundamental physics, but most of his work that will stand the test of time as his work in the field of astrophysics. In fact, astrophysics became a proper subject only by Saha's equation. So next slide. I will skip all this because next slide please. Yeah. So this is this equation that Saha established in around 1998. It's called the Saha equation. What does it say? It says that suppose you have a collection of atoms in a radiation bath. Typically, those atoms which are near the sun, they are facing a lot of radiation. So in a radiation bath, when you have atoms, you have to use not only statistical mechanics, but also quantized feature of atomic excitation. And then he established an equation that in this radiation bar or so-called heat reservoir, those who deal with thermodynamics have the heat reservoir created by solar radiation. The ratio of num uh, number density of ions excited, you could have several ionized, first ionized, second ionized. Ratio of ionized atom to neutral atom is given by 
by this expression, where T is the temperature of the bath, Ui is the energy difference between diet energy uh, ionized state and the ground state. So, and KD of course is the Boltzmann process. So your in this equation, therefore, you see both statistical mechanics and quantum mechanics because quantum mechanics will tell what is the energy level difference between the highest ionized state and the neutral ground level of the atom. And this equation made astrophysics possible. Remember, this was uh, published in late 1919. Till then, astronomers had no clue as to what is sun made of. Some people said sun is a solid object. Some people said sun's composition is like earth. Till Cecilia Payne, who was a brilliant astrophysicist, that time she did not receive much credit, but to, today we know Cecilia Payne uh, sort of opened up the study of composition of stars because she immediately used Saha's equation and established by, from the observation spectral lines etc. established the sun is predominantly made of hydrogen. During that time, this is in probably 1922 or she established. That was the thesis, actually. And many people said that the thesis is all, no, it's not correct. So today, of course, we give much review to her, but she used essentially Saha's ionization equation to establish sun is 75% by weight hydrogen, 24% by weight helium, and rest 1% other heavier elements. Next slide, please. So here is what you see Saha's genius was. He was not just a theoretical physicist or a theoretical astrophysicist towards his later time. So this is Saha when he was much older. He already had demanded that India should go for nuclear energy much before Omi Jamgir Bhava. Of course, there is a great deal of debate. Finally, it was Omi Jamgir Bhava. Uh, who sort of uh, took away from Meghnath Shah. This is a whole socio-political, I don't want to go into that. The whole nuclear physics thing, uh, which Saha to begin with championed and uh, uh, established the great nuclear centers that we are, first started with here by Mumbai and then we are in Mumbai. But Saha was, could not be uh, held by this, he immediately he said that you know, in Kolkata we should have our own nuclear sector. So today we have science from nuclear physics, Kolkata, variable energy cyclotron. Basically, due to Saha's own enterprise and uh, aggressive movement, so here you can see Saha is standing with the two Ds, you know, that the cyclotrons have these two B where the polarity changes in time so that particles can be accelerated in the same direction. You can see him uh, with the teams. Next slide, please. Okay, now we go to uh, uh, Raman. I will not talk much about Raman because Raman did when he worked in astrophysics, but I must tell you that he was the first physics from uh, laureate. But there's something to be learned from Raman's, uh, Raman's uh, you know, observation. First great work of Raman came when he first sailed out of India. He noticed that when you go out of India, the oceans, the European oceans are much bluer than Indian Ocean. He asked, why is it so? And he immediately argued that <coughs> the older theory that sea's color is it's just reflecting the earth, <coughs> the atmosphere, sky. Thank you, but yes, thank you, but I don't think I need it. I get the thank you, but I, I'll take it when it's really needed. So, <coughs> 
So therefore, he sort of turned the argument upside down. So thank you. He turned the uh, argument upside down that predominantly the reason for sun's color, color is due to scattering, not reflection. Reflection plays some part. If the sky is overcast, if the sky is grey, then you will see the sea is grey. But the blueness of the sea is not really reflection, but rather scattering of the light. And the reason why, uh, again, one has to do a little bit research, the reason why western seas are bluer is because they are colder atoms and therefore the, some of the scattering that cold atoms do and the scattering that hot randomly motion molecules of water are different and that's the reason. So, but his observation power and then going around and doing research, particularly polarization measurement of the radiation coming out of the uh, ocean, that established that it is the scattering of light. That's why sky color matters. But it is the light from the sky which scatters off the ocean that contributes the color of the sea. Next slide, please. By the way, I must say that there is a coincidence. So this is the so-called Raman effect, which was observed by his PhD student, Krishnan, who has stopped it to NPL by the way. So there is a room before the NPL uh, came up, he actually had a sitting space in our department. So we therefore as a mark of respect, that room is called K.S. Krishnan room. So Krishnan and Raman, Krishnan saw the effect, but Raman immediately realized the importance. What? Yeah, thank you. What Raman realized the importance of Krishna's observation is that when radiation comes and gets scattered off molecules, you see, in Raleigh scattering, the wavelength doesn't change. If blue comes and gets scattered by molecules, in Raleigh scattering, blue of wavelength lambda will be the same lambda scattered. But what Krishna saw at Raman immediately realized the importance was the scattered light was having frequency H nu naught plus H nu or H nu naught minus H nu. There's a gap B. H nu, there's a gap H nu. The higher frequency is called anti Stokes line, while lower frequency is called Stokes line. This cannot be explained by Radan's scattering. The real reason comes from quantum theory. But of course, the Habi, sorry, Raman being a genius, he gave a semi classical model of ellipsoidal charge distribution. But that's, although approximately it's okay, but real reason of Raman effects is due to quantized vibration analysis. I'll not go into the physics, anyone who wants to know. Uh, this for the Vigyan Prasad, I have given an explanation as to what the real it's available in the Vigyan Prasad site. Right, next slide, please. Yeah. Now comes one of the greatest genius of astrophysics, Subramanian Chandrasekhar, who happened to be also nephew of C. V. Rao. So, Subramanian. I mean, his story, if you go through, you'll be amazed. I mean, how can anyone who goes through it would realize that you know, everyone can't be Subramanian Chandrasekhar. He, in the school and before he completed his master, master's, he had already mastered the old quantum theory. Thermodynamics, special theory. And those who are interested, he, when Sommerfeld, Arnold Sommerfeld was visiting Chennai, he actually went to the hotel and met Sommerfeld, saying that, you know, I have studied all these books, I have also studied your atomic spectra book. Sommerfeld said, but all those are outdated. Now, new quantum theory has come up, new spectral 
theory has come up. So Chandrasekhar went back, studied all those. And of course he was brilliant, he had already written a research paper and he was selected by Cambridge University. So he, while he sailed uh, from Mumbai to London when he was only 19 years of age and in that huge ocean voyage for a lot of time he worked out the theory of white box. I'll briefly explain. Next slide please. So these were already known to Chandrasekhar because he read the great book by Arthur Eddington on astrophysics. So we know we see stars, but how are stars formed? It starts off with a neutral gas cloud, slowly shrinking due to its gravitational wave. Finally, when the core of the gas cloud becomes very hot, because if this gas cloud is getting compressed due to its own weight, Boyle's law, Charles law, when you compress something, it becomes hotter. Boyle's law, it is getting compressed due to its own weight. No one is putting a piston, but under its own weight, it is getting compressed. And the core becomes hotter and hotter. And when the temperature goes to around 10 to 6 to 10 to 7 degree Kelvin, Two, or rather effectively four protons, they fuse to go give rise to a helium nucleus. And huge amount of energy is being liberated, neutrinos are emitted. And a star is born. So in order to have a star, you need thermonuclear fusion to take place in the core. That's why you need a minimum mass. Jupiter, for example, just falls short of becoming a star. If you add some more mass to Jupiter, Jupiter will also turn into a star. So therefore, the stellar evolution, as time passes, first hydrogen combines to form helium, now the core becomes helium rich, then helium combines with protons, etc., forms carbon, then carbon dioxide, carbon, nitrogen, and so on. This whole chain of reactions. Next slide, please. So, and one of the reasons why the sun-like star doesn't immediately collapse is because gravity is trying to pull the matter towards the center, but the heat causes pressure, outward pressure, and the outward pressure balances the inward gravitational attraction. That's the reason why a sun-like star is in quasi-equilibrium. Similarly, why Earth also doesn't get crushed to a point due to gravity because there are core of Earth is very hot. The other effects for Earth, apart from simple gaseous pressure. Next slide please. And <clears throat> so, when Chandrasekhar was young, this was known how stars would evolve, how no mass star would evolve. Similarly, how an average star like sun would evolve. It was known that when the Nuclear fuel, the core gets over, the core becomes now dominated by carbon, oxygen and nitrogen. No more nuclear reaction can take place because they are high ion. The Z of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen is much larger. To have nuclear fusion, you need much higher temperature. For stars like sun, it is not possible. Then the question is what happens? People like Fowler, had established that electron degeneracy pressure will support collapse against gravity. While for high mass star, that time it was not known. Chandrasekhar said what happens if the core mass is much more? Can electron degeneracy pressure support the gravitational contraction? Next slide, please. So before I go to the slide as to what electron degeneracy pressure is, astronomers have already known about white box. For example, the Sirius, Sirius star is just near the right leg of the Orion constellation, those who have done a little bit of astronomy. So Sirius is very bright star, one of the brightest stars for the northern hemisphere. Sirius is not a single star. When you closely look through a telescope, you find that there is a very faint, almost point-like star. So that Sirius is called Sirius A and the, its companion is called 
serious being. In fact, serious being's existence was inferred even before it was actually seen by the fact that serious A, which was very bright, it was moving. Why would it move? It was moving to RBA. It's in a binary system. That's why you are moving. So serious B was discovered and serious B, lo behold, is so tiny, it is fainter, at the same time its temperature was very high. And that's how white dwarf was discovered and people immediately, people like Fowler, they worked out the theory. A typical white dwarf is billion times denser than water. By the way, sun's density is not very high. Sun's density, average density is about 1.5 grams per centimeter. Saturn is in fact even rarer than water. So if you had a large body of water, Saturn would float. So, Sun would eventually become a white bar. Okay, Sun's radius today is 6.96 into 10 to power 5 kilometers. Okay. When it becomes a white bar, it will be around its radius will be 6,000 kilometers. So its size will be like Earth. By the way, all these numbers I can quote, because numbers are very important. Anyone, when I was in BSc, MSc, I was more mathematically minded. I derived a lot of equations, but I did not pay attention to numbers. But when I went into the research, I found numbers are very important. Otherwise, you will khayali pula off of what you You will give a lot of mathematical results. But without the numbers, you will not realize that ki ye is dunya mein ho sake ki ya If the numbers are too tiny, it is insignificant. So numbers are very, then I realize that you have to pay attention to numbers. Next slide. Yeah. So this is a view which tells what happens. What is this electron due to the GNC pressure? Suppose we have normal gas, we have atoms, the nucleus, electrons belong to individual atoms. But when you pack them, when you pack them so close, what is the size of the atom? Size is the atom. Numbers are very important. Well, the nuclear size is one per one. But the electron density, quantum to go, that occupies one atom. So you pack the atom so that the average separation between atoms is about one to two atoms. Then electrons don't know to which nucleus it belongs. That's why it degenerates. That's why it's called degenerated electron. So electrons don't know to which atoms it belongs. Then electrons, because they're fermions, so whatever general potential you have to fill up, the thing using the Fermi exclusion principle. And what Fowler did was when he did that, he found that the degenerate electron pressure is proportional to the fifth, five third power of density. Fowler gave a full theory of white dwarfs. In science, you should not just accept. You have to think logically. So in this three or four months motion why Chandrashekha said, what if the core mass, if you have a massive star, core mass can be very large and the density, so if you have to balance the case extra gravity with the bigger larger mass, it has to shrink. If it shrinks, uncertainty principle, uncertainty principle. Remember, Chandrasekhar had mastered whatever known quantum mechanics that time in 1930. Remember, 1926 is Schrodinger equation, 1930 gave white box. Yeah. So, in 1930, he argued what, what if the core mass becomes so dense that the average separation between electrons is so tiny that the uncertainty delta P into delta X is greater than H divided by 4 pi. So delta X becomes very large, delta P can be very large. So we argue that if delta P, delta X becomes so small, delta P becomes so large that electrons are no longer non relativistic They are relativistic because you have the Famous equation from relativity, E is equal to square root of E square C square plus M square C four. So if E becomes very large, E square C square becomes much greater than So P C becomes much greater than M C square. M C square is a rest Once P C becomes much larger than M C square, 
that is caricaturage is much bigger than the square is rhythm is so shwanya immediately to use special equipment and found that the pressure and density relation for a relativistic system of degenerate electron is not density to a five third but density to about four third this power four third against five third is crucial he did the stability calculation had a study to be realized that there is a upper limit to the white dwarf mass next slide please so he found that as the mass increases so we start and find out the size and because of this you find that the size of the white dwarf is inversely proportional to mass more the mass white dwarf is smaller effectively the interplay of gravitation and quantum field <coughs> so if you don't use relativistic theory for electrons you will you can accommodate it with any mass of white dwarf but once you have accommodated relativity then beyond a particular mass white dwarf will have zero size in its first calculation in the graph of its first calculation he found that once you go to 1.4 times such mass the white dwarf size will be zero but nothing can be zero size and that's the reason many reported his work he did that make fun of his work that's another story i think that said that is ridiculous how can you start with on zero size and all that that's a separate story I didn't get it, but Chandra Shekhar is of different metal. He went down and finally Nobel Prize came to him because of this work. Next slide. So he gave that beautiful Chandra Shekhar limit result. You can see this result. It said say that the biggest white dwarf mass that we only this you see H bar C. Capital the fundamental constants, and you see hydrogen uh, mass or fundamental number. Hydrogen mass is just proton and electron combination. So the white dwarf critical mass is made out of all fundamental constants. And uh, when he established, then he should say the beautiful formula about an astronomical object which comes from fundamental constants that they. Covered in terrestrial laboratory. So, a star's mass is determined determined by fundamental laws. Okay, and if you evaluate the number, it's one point four solar mass. So, here I must take a aside. So, this is nineteen thirty nineteen thirty one. Another Russian great genius, Lundau. In 1930, James Chadwick discovered neutrons. Till then, neutrons. People didn't know that there was a neutron particle which strongly interacted and had slightly heavier than proton. Chadwick discovered neutrons immediately. Landau, he was aware of Chandrasekhar's work. Landau used Chandrasekhar's kind of calculation and showed that what if you have a star which is so compact that is. Nuclear density, and it will also be stabilized. That is, it can be more massive than white dwarf, but it will contract, and then electrons will fall onto the nucleus. Electron plus proton will make neutron and neutrino. Okay, so you have a neutron-rich object, and neutrons being fermions, again neutron degeneracy pressure can stabilize against gravity, and You will have a neutron star. Although he didn't say neutron star, he he actually used the word gigantic, gigantic nuclear star. Okay. Of course, today we don't know what is the upper limit mass for a neutron star because nuclear density is so high, and it's about 14 grams per centimeter cube. The equation of state is not known. So people are still debating whether the upper limit to neutron star is 2.5 solar mass or 3 solar. Mass. Still, lot of work 
That's why nuclear physicists determining the nuclear equation of state at such high density is very important. Next slide, please. Yeah, so it is essentially Chandrasekhar's work which led to people accepting that there could be other objects like neutron stars and when the mass exceeds the neutron star mass limit, it will become black. Before that, black hole solution is very old. Mathematical black hole solution is 1916 by Carl Schwarzschild. But people thought that was a mathematical idea. They don't really think you can't have black hole because you have star, big star. But after Chandrasekhar's work, Landau's work, black hole was a reality. So today, so Coach Chandrasekhar, he at the age of close to 70, he wrote a mammoth tome called the mathematical theory of black holes. So Chandrasekhar was a very different guy. Who at the age of 70 would do a mathematical work on black holes? By the way, someone must tell me how much time I have. Next slide, please. It is more important that I limit myself to whatever more information only creates confusion. So, then people studied globular clusters. They found that globular clusters, you can see, there are stars, normal stars, but point of it, they are very small, white ones. And measurement of mass was made. None of the white ones ever turned out any more massive than 1.4. Prediction of Chandrasekhar. And Chandrasekhar was given the Nobel Prize six times. By the way, Chandrasekhar predicted four things apart from white dwarf, but not many people know. So he, for example, predicted that he has a massive object, massive star moving in the background of lighter stars. Then, because of gravitation of the lighter star, the massive object will slow down. So called dynamical friction. He of course gave a mathematical theory, but people like Frank Shu, people like Vinny and Krimen, they have given simple explanation as to why this should happen. Why is it that if you have a massive star moving in the background of Loma star, why is it slow down? Very easy to understand. Go to the frame of reference of the massive star. In the frame of reference of the massive star, what will happen is that if the massive star is moving in this direction, in the frame of reference of the massive star, the star will be moving from this direction. But because of gravity, the stars will get focused. Because this is attracting, the stars will get focused. So number density of stars in the backward direction is more than the number density of stars in the forward direction. So therefore, this will pull the mass in this direction more than the stars here. That means it will move this direction. Or go back to the laboratory frame, this will slow down. This is called the dynamical friction. But Chandrasekhar was, he never developed physical intuition. Chandrasekhar was like a pure mathematician. You will start with one physics assumption, do a lot of mathematics, get a physics assumption. That's why his papers are very difficult to follow. Next slide, please. He made two other predictions. I have written an article for physics education. You can get it from. If you want to know from very physics point of view what all he has contributed, it's called S. Chandrasekhar, black holes, white walls, negative hydrogen ions, gravitational wave, etc. And evidence of dynamical friction is there. For example, globular clusters which are younger, you find stars are all mass everywhere, but older globular clusters, heavier mass, sink to the core because of dynamical friction. Similarly, in numerical simulation of galaxies, when two galaxies are close by, compact objects sink towards the core. So, there's of course numerical simulation. Next slide, please. And here, actual pictures of interacting galaxies where you see that no matter how the galaxies interact, heavier objects sink to the core region. Next slide, please. The next person I must pay tribute to is Professor T. C. Vaidya. Professor, the full name was Professor Prahla Chunilal Vaidya. Uh, he for a long time taught in various universities in Gujarat. Last time I met him was in uh, Sardar Vallabh Vidya Bihar University. He was a great teacher. In fact, uh, we attended 
winter schools where he would teach. His style of teaching was very unique. He would ask us to come to the board and write. Initially, you know, what is this? But when you do that, you feel confident. Ha! Huh. In front of everyone, you know, we are students, right? In front of everyone, I can write things on the blackboard. So he was a great Gandhian. He actually fought during the freedom struggle. He used to uh, join the Gandhian protest, civil disobedience movement. But during that time, the turmoil was happening during the, before independence, he got some ideas. He wrote to Professor Vishnu Vasudev Narlik, who was in PhD group. He is the father of our Professor Jain Vishnu Narlik. That can I come and do research with you? He came and in 1951 he worked out, the idea he had worked out, but then people had only discovered time independent solution, exact solution from general relativity. He for the first time gave an exact solution from general relativity, which is time independent, and it corresponded to a spherical system, spherical symmetric system from which Zero response particles are coming out. It's called the radiating space time. And because energy is being carried away, this mass is losing mass. So the geometry is time dependent. So this solution is called the India solution. And as a review to the international, it's called the Vaidya metric. And it's caused many developments. Vaidya metric is responsible for many developments in general relativity. Right. Here is a young professor, Vaidya, uh, teaching uh, his daughter some physics and mathematics. He was a great teacher, outstanding. You know, I mean, he's a teacher of a very different kind, not the kind of teachers you see. Not like the great teachers like Professor Mukunda or Raja Ramana that you see today. He was very different. Next, I come to Professor Amal Kumar Rai Chodhi, who for a long time, Taught in Nurse Presidency College, now called Presidency University. Presidency College happens to be the first college set up by British. Uh, so, uh, anyway, let me, I will go to his physics rather than. He is known that the equation he developed and published in 1955 and did more generalization of in 1957 paper. And it is this equation, internationally called Raichodri equation, which, as you know, two years back, Penrose got the Nobel Prize for ethics uh, for his singularity theorem. So Penrose and Hockey, they proved the singularity theorem using the Raichodri equation, which Penrose and Hockey in their papers, they mentioned, uh, they refer to Raichodri's work and quote Raichodri equation. And next slide, please. So this is the right of the equation. I don't have time to explain basically. Theta is roughly the area between light rays and we show that no matter what kind of space-time geometry equivalent in gravity you take, the light rays get focused. And singularity the force. And when Rose and Hawking realized that if light rays focus, eventually they will meet and cause singularity. So already in paper right should be talking about the motivation. He is trying to understand can we avoid the Big Bang singularity. Next slide please. So as you know Big Bang model which is the most mm, popular model of cosmology says that universe started from a space time singularity. What is singularity? Things become infinite. The density becomes infinite. The space time curvature becomes infinite. Temperature becomes infinite. As you know, infinity cannot be tackled in physics, so therefore it's called singular problem. So, Raichandri's right motivation was can we avoid singularity? That's the reason why he established the situation. Black hole is also singularity. Black hole, when entire matter collapses to a single point, you have density infinity, curvature infinity. So it's singularity. And all these singularity studies in classical generality, they often hinge on using Raichodri equation. Next slide. So anyway, this is 
So therefore, the entire how Big Bang happened, what it led to. Righteous equation plays a very important role. Next slide, please. Next, I will come to Professor Baidu Pampu. He was an outstanding astronomer who set up Indian Institute of Astrophysics, Bangalore. He did a lot of work in Kodaikanal Observatory, the present present telescope <coughs> in Kavalu, set up by IA, called as a mark of respect to Professor Bhappu, it's called Manu Bhappu Telescope. And uh, next slide, please. So, Wilson and independently Manu Bhappu, they, when they were measuring the luminosity of population one star, population one star, the sun is a population one star, those stars where apart from hydrogen helium, there are some more heavier elements also. They found, I mean, both Wilson and Bob found that the absolute brightness in the actual luminosity of a population one star is correlated by the width of the emission line of doubly ionized calcium atoms. So, in fact, calcium doubly ionized, the many lines is the center of the K line, which the, so you, I mean, it's not easy to discover this law, right? So they, remember how great experiment is there. They bored at all the lines and they found one of the central lines of the doubly ionized calcium has this property that brighter the star, the calcium present in the atmosphere of the star, the width is also bigger. So there's a correlation okay, of the width and, and therefore what is the significance? The great significance. How do I know the actual luminosity of the star? I can't go to the star and measure. I only see what is the apparent flux. But if I have measured the width, I mean it can infer what is the actual luminosity and thereby I can infer that. Distance. So it's called the Wilson Bhappu effect. Next slide, please. Next, uh, I'll talk about son of C. V. Ramakrishnan, Professor V. Ramakrishnan, who for a long time uh, he was the director of Raman Research Institute, and he, along with Cook, when they were in Australia, he, he was a colourful person. He had. <coughs> Run away from C. V. Raman, sailed off to Australia, did all odd jobs in Australia. Finally, in one of the Australian observatory, he became an assistant. He was also a very different kind of a person. Anyone of senior members who have met Radha Krishna would know he was a very peculiar kind of person. So, uh, he established, along with Cook, a rotating vector model for pulsars and it explains the change in polarization in a pulsar uh, individual pulses very effectively. Okay. Although it doesn't explain the pulsing mechanism, but the sweep of polarization is very nicely explained by the Radha Krishnan Cook model. And then later on, uh, Professor Chi Srinivasan and Professor Radha Krishnan, they actually gave an explanation for why sudden pulsar, the time period is few milliseconds. Earlier people thought you can't have millisecond pulsar. They gave a recycle model, which is still a very good model, where the pulsar is spun up by matter going around the pulsar, as the matter falls from the star, it just spins it up. As though, you know, <coughs> when you have a ball, a good ball, if I rotate, eventually it will slow down. But I keep on making it. So similarly, the gas going around pulsar is forcing it to rotate faster. Uh, so next slide please. So as you know, a pulsar is a neutron star rotating about this axis, but it has an inclined magnetic field. It's like a bar magnet inclined as it rotates, the electric field is uh, it's generated a changing magnetic field called the electric field. The powerful electric field accelerates the electrons and electrons move out, essentially pouring out energy in this conical structure, this like a cosmic lighthouse. 
and uh, so the so called vectors of the magnetic fields they according to Radha Krishnan uh, model they cause a change in the polarization of radiation next slide please uh, now I come to another great general relativist C. V. Vishweshwara who when he was doing his PhD in the Maryland with uh, what's his name? Another great generalist, the name has slipped out of He what he realized that if you perturb a black hole, the black hole rings like a bell. And he estimated the wavelength of this ringing more. And he gave rise to a new field altogether. Today the field of study is called quasi normal modes of black holes. So it's great. Humorous speaker, uh, he used to make us laugh in his lectures during winter school session. The faint evidence of ringing of the black hole was actually seen in the first detection of the binary black hole coalescence in the LIGO detector. So, this is a theory, this is a theoretical prediction, gravitational wave activity, but when the two black holes coalesce, you see it is a ringing damp yeah. I'll wind up, I think. Uh, so, so there's a black hole. If you put up in the event horizon of select, next slide. He was a great cartoonist in the Conference Life Science Center in Symposium held in 1979. He drew this cartoon that if you have a black hole, if an ant sneezes, it will cause a black hole to get perturbed and send a damp ringing mode. Uh, so, next slide. And in fact, fortunately, Professor C. V. Vishwashwara was alive when in 2016 the first direct detection of gravitational wave was made and we could do the detection. Although it's not high statistical confidence, there's a signature of the beginning mode. Next slide, please. The last, in the last astrophysicist I talked about. Professor Govind Suru, another person who was very peculiar in his uh, nature. He, indigenous, remember, in 1964 he started the Bhuti Radio Telescope project. Indigenous, with Indian astronomers, Indian engineers, he set up the first ever Bhuti Radio Telescope that, that did a lot of uh, great work on measurement of sizes of radio galaxy discovery of pulsars. Finally, around 1986, he got another brilliant idea. Well, in Western countries, mobile phones were having a lot of radio noise. In India, mobile phones had not entered and he found that at the level of one meter wavelength, there's a noise is very low. And one meter wavelength is very important because there's a 21 centimeter line. So neutral gas, which is very far away at redshift line, their radiation will be reduced to 1 meter. And he decided to study galaxy formation by developing a giant meter radio wave telescope in Khodan, which is near Narayan now in Maharashtra. Next slide, this is my last slide. So this is the famous Uti radio telescope reclining on a hill in uh, Uti. And this slope he chose because this axis is parallel to the Earth's axis. So that as the earth goes on, it will keep on seeing different objects. While this is the telescope array in GMRT. Those I suggest that you go for uh, schools or summer internship in GMRT. This is a very fabulous place. So next slide. Thank you. I stop. As I said, don't believe whatever I have said. You must question. You might have to try to prove that I am wrong. Only then science will progress. Science is not believing me whatever I have said. You must try to show that I am wrong somewhere whatever I have said. And I will very happy. I, I in fact in my class, I have told that anyone who asks me a question based on whatever I am teaching, for which I don't have an answer, I will give one mark. So you can correct marks by asking questions for whose answer I don't.
आफ्टरनून टायर्ड फील करता है 